the best way to reduce the amount of time you have to spend on content but still get great content is to batch it and do it in one time. You are now listening to the Creative Juice Podcast brought to you by Entrepreneur.io. What's up, Indies? Welcome back to the Creative Juice Podcast. I'm your host, Jack McCarthy. This is episode 263, where we get in the weeds about how to 10x your productivity in your music business, which I think is a really important topic for musicians that are juggling a ton of stuff day to day, week to week, month to month. We're all wearing a lot of different hats, and we see this all the time both at the Indie X agency where we work with a ton of artists and bands and our Indie Founder coaching program and in the Indies community. So we're going to be sharing some ideas, some tips, some strategies, and some tech that we use on a weekly, daily basis with our clients. With me, as always, is my co-host, Mr. Ed Isola, to run it down. Ed, what's good, dude? How's it going, dude? I think that anytime somebody hears the, the comment 10x anything, uh, perks your ears up. So I'm hoping that today we'll give you guys some insight into ways to really become more productive, like Jack said, that I think ultimately leads you to 10xing, you know, your business down the road. And and I think that that's really exciting. So, you know, I almost say it tongue in cheek, like, oh, you're going to 10x. I almost say it tongue in cheek, but truly, I think a lot of the tools and the processes that we're going to talk about today will help artists kind of get more done in a week than they would have pre or get, get really get more done in a day than a lot of times that they would have gotten done in a week or sometimes even a month. I know there's a couple tips here that I, one in particular, I know is going to wipe out a big pain point or objection that a lot of artists have when it comes to their marketing and how to really kind of pack in a lot of work into a, into a small period of time. So I'm excited to get into it. But yeah, I, uh, <laughs> it either makes people 10x either makes people's ears perk up or makes them roll their eyes. And you know what, I'm fine either way. <laughs> Dude, Absolutely. But but I think more than anything, what we're going to get into with the productivity is that like you said, it, it allows you to do more in a day. But I also feel that like my personal journey of learning how to kind of harness my productivity, I feel better at the end of the day. So like, and I feel better for tomorrow. And so the goal isn't just to be like, all of a sudden you do way more in the day, right? Like that's a byproduct of what we're going to talk about. But like, it also is to help you give, to have that longevity where like you have systems, you have processes and you feel like I can show up and point and shoot essentially what your target is for the day, accomplish it, do a bunch of that. And at the end of the day, know like, hey, here's what's going to happen tomorrow. And I'm going to just show up again and do the same process. And so I think that's a nice like kind of secondary thing to keep in mind as we go through this is it's not only about doing more. It's about feeling better about what you do and, and being able to do it for a longer term. For sure. Yeah. Not hitting those periods of burnout and also not just getting more done, but doing what you're working on with better output. You know, the quality is better. You're more content with the work that you actually do, not not feeling like you're spreading yourself too thin. And additionally, to another point that you made, like whether you're working by yourself or you're working with a band or you're working with a team, I think a lot of the stuff that we're going to talk about will bring you to a place where you can start to, you know, slot people into different roles, possibly more effectively than you've done, been able to do before. So a lot of this will be uh, hopefully insightful to, you know, people that are in management kind of roles or like people organizing roles, whether you're an artist manager or you're kind of leading a team. Hopefully there'll be some processes and tools that we use at the agency that will kind of shine a light on a lot of the stuff that we do here that kind of shoehorns that all into a a well-oiled machine dude love it take it away let's do it yeah let's get into it i think the first one that i want to lead with here and this is a big one is something i still hear to this day with a lot of artists that i talk to both in the indie community outside of the indie, indie community at our agency clients is that they just don't have enough time to make content or uh, I don't know, man, like how often do you hear artists say things like, 
man, I just don't want to be a content creator. I want to be focused on making the music and I don't want to be distracted by that or have to, you know, fit that into my week or fit that into my studio time or whatever the excuse is. I'm, I'm, I'm very explicitly calling it an excuse, but it is an objection and a, I think a pain point that I hear all the time. Well, and I think that like, you know, you just said excuse and then you said pain point. And I think that people give a lot of excuses because it's such a huge pain point, right? Like you do have to have content. Unfortunately, unless you're at a point where you have enough revenue to hire an entire content team to follow you around and produce stuff like, you know, the A-list musicians, you're going to have to figure out how to get creative with your content and, and to do that. And I'm very sympathetic to this because it's not something that I particularly love to do. Like, Getting content has always just been a, a, like everybody, a thorn in my side, but it's something that I understand is important. And so I think that there's ways to go about doing that, that we're going to get into that. Number one, it's like you have to get content, but it doesn't have to be like this incredibly brutal, repetitive process. And the first thing we kind of want to talk to on that point is the fact that the best way to reduce the amount of time you have to spend on content but still get great content is to batch it and do it in one time and this is something that i've heard you know obviously jack and i have talked about but i've heard from other artists that are large artists that like they even do this and there's agencies that social agencies that like say hey here's the best thing like block off two days we're going to come down we're going to videotape all your content for the next month working off of this social strategy we've done and then we'll come back the next month right so like obviously those people are expensive and as an independent artist you may not want to hire or outsource that much or be able to but what i think it kind of exemplifies is the fact that it's not that complicated like you probably spend two hours putting together a content plan for the month then you spend a few hours itemizing out like here's the videos that i want to get to link up with this And then you spend a day or two filming that content and you can keep in mind how to film it. So it's not like some crazy process where you have to edit it, right? You can do like single shot type stuff or whatever. That's more than enough to get content for a month. And it's really two and a half, three days out of 30 days. I think that's max. I was going to say like base level here, like pick a day once a month, eight hours where you batch content. And then you don't have to think about making content again for the rest of the month. That solves the pain point of like, how do I fit this into my schedule in the studio? Or how do I sort this around, you know, trying to write songs or trying to do the other marketing work that I'm doing or playing shows or whatever it might be. Then anything else you get content wise is icing on the cake throughout the rest of the month. But you've got your sort of pillar content all taken care of and set up. I've heard La Russell talk about this. I just spoke with one of our IndieX clients yesterday. Their band was batching content. They were batching content for their membership, actually, and they were doing like three full cover videos in a row, and they were doing it at rehearsals so that they were batched ahead for about, uh, they they released them these this specific type of cover content they put out about every three weeks as as one of the kind of content pieces for their membership exclusively. They do them every three weeks. So that means they're batched for nine weeks worth of content right there. And they did it in one rehearsal, you know, live, but really well shot and and great sounding content. And then they, you know, snip it up into social clips to get people into their membership. But they knocked that out in like a three hour rehearsal. That's not even a full day. Yeah, that, that's the thing I think people discredit when it comes to like, oh, I don't like content. It's it's actually never really the act, the filming of the actual content that's difficult or time consuming. It's the preparation leading up to it. And so like Jack say, like you can spend the morning brainstorming, spend the afternoon capturing one eight hour day. For me, what I was kind of getting at was I like to do things in small chunks over the course of a couple of days where like maybe I do three mornings in a row. But regardless, we're both talking about the same thing where it's like, you know, one to two to maybe max three days to get content. And obviously this isn't like the way you batch content if you're going to do an entire album launch or something. Like that's different. We're talking about like social content and understanding like, hey, I'm going to do two or three posts a week on these platforms. Here's what those posts are going to look like. Let me go get it. And here's what they're about. I also think it gives you a really cohesive idea of where your brand's going and what your brand's talking about. And I think that's super important. But 
yeah, it just removes such a headache to batch content. And like the second you can get ahead, you know, you were just saying this band's nine weeks ahead or whatever. As soon as they're ahead, all of a sudden they now feel, I'm guessing, like a weight has been lifted off their shoulders and they push the boulder up the mountain, so to speak, where the first time they had to learn these songs and they had to batch these three videos. But then all of a sudden it's like, whoa, we got a little breathing room now. We got a little space. We can we can be a little bit more creative because we were nine weeks out. And so now you can you start to free up the process where ultimately the goal is that you do get a couple months ahead of having this content and then you don't have to worry about it. Right. Like you're not under pressure at that point. Totally. I mean, and two, two things with that one, like let's make it plain and simple here. We batch content for the podcast from time to time too. So like, yeah. this is a process that you totally can iron out. And I love what you said about the prep work being kind of the hardest part, like the on-ramp to doing content is, you know, the hardest part that people don't like. Well, that definitely goes beyond the surface that we're talking about here. Because think about this. If you decide to batch content all in one day, the prep work happens at the beginning of that. And then you're not having to repeat that prep work, you know, three days. Let's, let's say you were trying to spread out your content one day a week or something like that, or two days a week, or fitting it into everything else that you're doing throughout the week. And it's kind of just scattered. That means that prep work happens at the beginning of every time that you batch con or that you try to you know, prepare content as opposed to once when you're batching. And you're, if you're just doing that part, the worst part once a month, it really gets it out of the way and it will cut down on that, you know, sort of drag that happens every time. So I think that's a really, really important point to consider. And about the IndieX client that I was talking about, yeah, it's interesting that you say that it feels like there was a weight off their shoulders because the context of that conversation was they actually, their batching schedule got a little messed up because one of the guys was, uh, I think he was sick or something happened with their rehearsal schedule and they actually slipped up and they were like, Hey, if we don't batch again right away, we're going to be behind. And you know, the stress kind of was about to creep back up. So again, they caught themselves in this moment of like, we don't want to get behind on our batching because all of a sudden then we're going to be trying to catch up and chase after this. So yeah, it, it kind of self-regulates, which is really cool. Right. And they're operating from a place of, of control versus like, oh, we are already behind. It's like, well, hold on, we need to do this so we stay ahead, not like panic, we're already behind. Two other quick notes on batching. I think that something I experienced recently was uh, touring creates a unique experience. Like if you're out on the road doing shows, it creates a unique experience to easily batch content. Something that myself and Joe, who's an account manager at IndieX and also in the 502s, we are a you know, five, six person band, go do shows, right? And people come out and at the end of the night, we go on Instagram and here's 15 or 20 stories that have tagged us in a concert clip. Right. And presumably like from a cool clip of the concert, what we would do is go through those, look at them and say, send them a DM and say, Hey, can you drop this video file in this Google drive folder or email it to us and like, send us your username and we'll tag you if we post it. And all of a sudden we're just, we have this huge backlog of like fan content that looks really nice. Obviously if it looks bad, you don't use it, but like, that's a super easy way if you're out touring to get content too built up for the live show that I feel like is really was no more effort than Joe and I going through, you know, 15, 20 DMs and sending this message every night and saying, thanks for coming, blah, blah, blah. And so I think that's something that's really interesting. I love that. Yeah. The other piece of batching content that I found to be helpful is that if you are in a push for like a single or something like that, picking the part of the song that you're pushing knowing it well, and then just wherever you're going, whatever your concept of the thing is, whether it's, if it's a, you know, performance video, if it's a, uh, just lyrics and you're kind of standing there on top of your head, like the lyrics are on top of your head. Those are so easy to pump out in succession where you can walk down the street to five different locations. And all of a sudden you got five clips of the, of the audio that look different, right? Like different backdrops. So those are just two kind of quick tips on batching that I've I've learned over the last year that have made my life easier that hopefully as you start to travel, you can kind of pick up on and, and give yourself a backlog and expand the types of content you're posting. 
Yeah, dude, I totally love that. I have a tip as well. This is a tech tip and a tool. If you're working on graphic content at all, I know everyone's probably familiar with Canva, so this might be a little bit of a dull moment. However, something to definitely look into, which is kind of a a little known feature, I think, or something that isn't being as effectively used as it could, is if you're in Canva and if you use the pro plan, which I believe is around like $120 a year, so it's pretty cheap for one user, they have a batch creation tool for assets that you create in Canva. And the cool part about this is you can then insert data. You can upload data via CSV or type in data manually. And it essentially works like a spreadsheet where you'll have like a column that might be, you know, a line of copy and another column that might be lyrics, for example. And then you set those as essentially little tags in the piece of creative that you're making. And it will then pull from that data sheet and create batched content based on the graphic template that you've created. And then you can go in and, you know, if you wanted to change a background on one of them, change the color scheme on another, swap out photos, so on and so forth. But it can really speed up the content creation process for social media graphics, for example. It's really, really awesome. And there's a lot you can do with it, especially if you use other tools for things like copywriting help or making variations of copy. We'll get into that in a little bit here, but that's a Canva tip that I would definitely recommend if you're a Canva user or if you're not, definitely worth checking out. Um, I've been doing a lot of that recently, so it's a hopefully a little pro tip for you. You said at the start of that, you go, it's a, here's a tech tip. I felt like there should be a graphic that like slaps on the screen and just like, tech tip but uh you know (laughs) no but like really if anyone's ever designed graphics you know that it's it's not you know my personal favorite it's probably not your personal favorite thing and the ability to now batch it on canva is just such a time saver so definitely something to to look into and, and take jack up on and explore because it's awesome the next productivity tip that i want to get into here has to do with communication I think that this is a big one for a lot of a lot of artists, especially as you're starting to build a team. And I especially want to make this recommendation for anyone that's managing artists or working with record labels uh, or management teams or you know any kind of really distributed group is get out of email. <laughs> email is fine for you know one-off uh, sort of things that come up, but Speaking as someone who works with a a lot of different people across many different artist teams, no one wants to be in an email thread with nine different cooks in the kitchen trying to decide on an email subject line for a marketing campaign going back and forth for an hour and trying to figure out who's saying what to who and what's the actual approach to go. So what I recommend and what we use at IndieX for all of our communication with our clients is have a Slack channel for your team. This might seem like a no-brainer if you've used Slack before or any kind of instant messaging. Maybe you're used to doing like group DMs on your phone uh, or even, I don't know, group DMs on Instagram or Facebook or something like that. But Slack is definitely a power-up, in my opinion, and I would definitely consider it. It will immediately give you a way to keep yourself out of email inbox hell, which is what I <laughs> what I always say when I'm introducing a new IndieX client to Slack and how we use it. It's just a very easy way to keep things uh, organized, keep things all streamlined in one channel. It really, really helps. I, I couldn't recommend it more. Yeah, I love Slack too. I think that like, if you get in Slack, you're like, I hate it. I think the main takeaway that Jack's getting after here is like, Get out of email and get into a messaging service. You know, there's Slack. There's people probably use WhatsApp. I mean, like I wouldn't use Instagram DMs, but you could use Facebook Messenger. Probably not the best option, but still there. But I, th- I think the key is figuring out what messaging system works for you and your team and where people actually respond and implementing that because it's so much more efficient to make decisions. And, and that's what this is about is helping with the productivity, right? Where if you're going back and forth on email, like Jack said, it might take you an hour or two hours to figure out a subject line or, you know, worse, make a bigger decision. If you're messaging, which is the equivalent of texting, then you're probably getting those messages read quicker and you're probably making a decision quicker, which is just so important. So Slack is, I think a really great one because it's a standalone app where you also have the control to not just make your phone into a essentially just like a constant pager for you, which is something that I've always been sensitive to. 
you can turn off notifications. You can work in it on your laptop. You can pull it up there. So some kind of messaging service where you're, where you can put the messages in this thing. And when you're ready to read them, go for it and respond quickly and be notified. It's just such a relief, I think, versus emails, which never, like Jack said, go smoothly or quickly. I like Slack a lot as a business app because it integrates so nicely with many other things. You know, Google Drive, you can upload files to it. Uh, it integrates with project management tools. It's, yeah, it's just a really nice streamlined platform where you can have everything kind of living in in one place for messaging purposes. I think it's really great in that way. Again, like you said, the fact that there's a standalone app for it is really good. You can turn notifications on and off as you'd like. That story about nine people in an email thread about a subject line actually comes from our agency. (laughs) One of our account strategists was dealing with that with a team that you know, kind of refused to be in Slack uh, or some of the people involved in making decisions weren't in the channel. And you can imagine what kind of night- nightmare that is when a decision is trying to be made. It just, it spreads out the amount of time, uh, the wait time for decisions really being made. So in terms of trying to amp your productivity up, a messaging app is going to do wonders <laughs> for it. So I can't recommend that enough. And this is kind of a, an offshoot to it. Another tool that we use as kind of our part of our project management stack here at the NDX agency is Asana. And Asana, you can kind of think of it as, for anyone who has never used a a project management tool online, you can kind of think about it as like a to-do list on steroids. Maybe you use... Uh, you know, the notes app on your phone, or maybe you use something like, uh, like planner or Todoist. Uh, there's so many, you know, mobile phone apps out there for keeping track of what you need to do. Maybe you just use a whiteboard or a notepad or whatever, but Asana at, at the very base level, you could use it simply as just a very interactive to do list for the projects that you have going on. You can assign tasks to certain people on your team. You can set deadlines. You can apply subtasks to them. We use it across the agency where all of our clients are set up with a project. We use a board view, uh, which is a bit more complex where we're tracking what's going on week to week uh, in dedicated columns. But you don't need to get that technical with it when you're starting out. I think there's a lot of overwhelm when it comes to using these sort of tools or trying to start using them. Really, if you want to get started, just set up a list for one of your projects. Let's say you're starting with, uh, I don't know, let's say you're working on an album. You could set up uh, a to-do list for the production stage, the marketing asset stage, you know, the production of your actual marketing assets, you know, your videos, your graphics, uh, your artwork, website pages, merch, so on and so forth, uh, the timelines for how you're actually going to be launching the marketing. You could set these up all as items under a you know, project to do list, and then assign them out to members on your team. If you've got a team, assign them to yourself if you don't. And it allows you to kind of systematically go down one by one and check things off. It can keep you accountable as far as deadlines. You know, you can get notifications and emails when a deadline is coming up or when it's missed. And you can really just set up like very simple but effective to-do list on Asana before you get into the weeds with, you know, multiple projects and setting up, you know, weekly plans and things like that. You don't have to dive in too deep to start, but it's definitely a product a productivity saver and hack if you just start with a to-do list in this way. Absolutely. And like, I, you know, like you said, we use Asana. I think it's fantastic. There's different things you can use, even if it's a piece of paper. But I think at the end of the day, what I use Asana for personally is in the morning, I pretty much go in there and I look and I say, what do I need to do today? Right. And obviously that entails me keeping that up to date. But like Jack said, there's a literal checklist of things and you set due dates. And so in its simplest form, you're able to just go in, have what you need, put a little description and much like the batching of the content. And this is what I was talking about earlier, where The goal of productivity in my mind is to be able to wake up, not have to think about what you have to do. And just to know that like, here's what I'm doing for the day, right? Like maybe there's, maybe there's two minutes of thinking about it and reading about it, but you don't have to sit and plan your day. You don't have to sit and be like, oh, okay, well, uh, maybe I have time to do this. Maybe I have time to do that. Like you just kind of wake up and, and you look and you say, here's what I'm doing today. 
I think when you get to that place, you'll start to see like, well, I'm done with everything by two o'clock. I have way more time for what I need. And Asana for me is, is the tool that kind of allows me to do that because I keep it organized. You can set recurring tasks. I know what's going on. And in terms of like one-off actionable items, excluding meetings, which we're going to talk about in a second, that kind of stuff is just there for me. And I know what's going on. And, and it's such a great tool if you can get in the process of using it yourself because it takes the stress away too of having to think about, am I doing enough? Am I doing it quick enough? What do I need to do tomorrow? And you just wake up, check them off, and you're done. Yeah, that's really well said. I think I agree. One of the things that I like most about Asana is the my tasks view. And this, you know, this might sound really simplistic, but for anyone that hasn't used a tool like Asana, and there's a lot out there, there's a lot of different ones. You can think about things like Trello, ClickUp, Monday.com. If you look at one of them, you'll immediately start getting ads for the others, but they all have similar functions. But Asana, one of the things I really like about it is that My Task tab, where I can see very quickly at a glance in the morning, or realistically for me, I like to I like to look at my next day the night before and really kind of battle plan it out. But you can see at a glance, like what's literally highest priority due, you know, the next day or that day. And that can be massively beneficial if you have trouble staying organized uh, with what you have to get done in the time that you have to do it. And that's kind of a nice segue, I think, to the discussion of like time blocking. We've already talked about like batching content, but I think that idea of batching work also applies to a lot of the other stuff that you might be doing in a given week. You know, you wear a lot of hats, especially as an independent artist, most likely you're doing more than just, you know, creating the music, especially if you are not working with a team or you've got a small team, you're probably shifting around and working on a number of different things at any given time. I think one thing that's really helpful here and Ed and I, and really the rest of our team kind of operates this way when we work is, you know, setting off time blocks in our calendars for certain types of work. You'll block off times for, you know, recurring meetings that you have, but then you might have a block for specifically client work. You know, for example, on Wednesdays, like I've got a, I've got a block for artist tasks. That is a three hour block. That's totally free of everything else. And it's blocked off on my calendar that nothing else can go there. And that can really help you with setting aside dedicated time to work on specific things. And that way you don't get that tug of war where you're getting pulled in all sorts of different directions. You might say, okay, you know, from 9 a.m. to noon on Mondays, I am specifically only going to work on uh, writing copy for the content that I batched for, you know, the next month. That could fit in really, really nicely into a block like that. And you just knock it all out and it lives on your Google Calendar, which uh, was, a, was a tech tip that Ed wanted to bring out of a solid way of using Google Calendars. Again, I think you can, a lot of people use Google Calendar or a calendar app, but there are some really unique ways that you can get creative with how you set yours up so that kind of all pieces of your life talk to each other and you don't miss a meeting or you don't miss something that you were trying to do because everything lives all in one place. I think that what Jack's getting out here is really important. And I think it's kind of interesting because Slack is the communication day to day, right? Like messaging Asana and time blocking in the Google calendar. Those three things to me are the key of my productivity and they work together very, very closely. And so I, I think Jack kind of hit the points of all the benefits of all these different things and that kind of stuff. But when I think about like, how would I understand this? I feel like it's super helpful for me to just quickly tell you guys, like, here's how I use it personally. And so on my calendar, like, first of all, here's, here's the things that I have. Here's my calendars, right? I have a calendar for entrepreneur. I have a calendar for my band, the 502s. And I have a calendar for my personal, you know, my personal life, essentially. Entrepreneur and 502s, obviously those two things are pretty explanatory. You have, you have marketing related stuff and you have writing music and shows and that kind of stuff for 502s. Personal life, I have everything from haircuts, going to the gym, like anything I do day to day where I'm like, I need time for this, or you know, my dentist was, appointment was in there recently. I have those three calendars. And so 
what, how I run it is I have my entrepreneur calendar where I have all my recurring phone calls with clients, with the NDX team. This podcast is on there and Jack and I are going to record it. And that's just set to repeat every single week. And then I have my 502 calendar where I ultimately ended putting in literal time and being like, here's my block of time to work on 502's related marketing stuff. Here's my block of time to work on writing music. And I just said it and I repeated it every week. And I, and I sat down, obviously, when I was doing these calendars and I said, okay, I want to spend six hours a week writing music. I want to spend two hours a week practicing, right? Like whatever time you want to do, I added that in there. And then I put my personal there and I said, okay, I'm going to go to the gym Monday, Wednesday, Friday for an hour and put it in there. Here's my dentist appointment, right? And so what I do at the start of each week is I have these chunks of time. And this this is time blocking, by the way, that I'm talking through time blocking that I've put onto Google calendars. And I took those Google calendars. Yeah, we're taking this concept and making it like real in terms of how it interacts with your tech stack. I think that's really helpful. Right. Yeah, yeah. And, and please, Jack, like if you if you hear extra tips, feel free to stop me and be like, here's what I do too, right? No, please. I mean, it, it lines up perfectly with how I operate as well. I'm sure I learned it from you. Smart man. <laughs> but so what, what I did was I have these three Google calendars and I have my set time block every single week. My weeks look very similar unless we're traveling. And so every, you know, every Sunday or every Monday night, I just go in and I look and I say, is this still correct for the week? Maybe I have to add a dentist appointment. Maybe I'm, you know, going out of town on Friday. So I have to move some things around. I just go into these calendars and I look and, and I make sure that it's still accurate for the week, Monday through Sunday. And I have those three calendars, again, Entrepreneur 502's personal synced up my yeah. iCalendar. And so all three of those things feed into one calendar. And so that's kind of the setup of my time blocking and how I organize using my calendars. And then I have it on my phone and I have it on my Apple Watch. And essentially I wake up in the morning and it says, okay, from nine to 11, I am working on new 502s music. From 11 to 12, I'm at the gym. At 12.15, I have a phone call. At 1.15, I have a phone call. Podcast at 3.45, 502s live video here. And, you know, go on a date. That's my last, you know, 7 p.m., whatever. But what it does for me is it allows me to just open my phone up every day. And obviously, similar to the batching content, there is a lot of legwork there. But now that it's set up, it just repeats and it's very quick for me. But I open my phone up every day. I look at my calendar and I say, okay, here's the things I got to do today. I'm ready to go. And once I'm in that time block, then I can just focus on I am I am just working on music right now. I can Focus 100% on this phone call. I can focus 100% at the gym. I don't have to be like I used to checking, you know, oh, that, make sure I'm not missing, make sure I'm not missing something. And so I think that power, that power of a calendar there is really important. And just real quick, the last piece that ties in there is Asana, where I have blocks of time in there that say entrepreneur marketing work, 502's marketing work. And that's when I go into 502's marketing work. That's when I go into Asana and say, what are my, what are my tasks for today? or for this week and I work ahead. But I hope that that kind of gives like an idea of, and this might be different, but it gives an idea, I think, of of how to time block in a way that is very repetitive. So you don't have to spend three hours a week blocking out your time. Like you probably have a very repetitive schedule and that's not a bad thing, but you probably have a fairly repetitive schedule that you can take advantage of that to increase your productivity and focus on on it more when you're in that time window, like I was saying. A side thought on that, because I can hear sirens going off for a number of things, probably for a lot of different artists, is one, you know, a lot of people think of themselves as like spontaneous and they're like, I don't have, you know, like I don't want to block off because I'm spontaneous and I don't have a lot of repetition. I think you said it well, Ed, there's probably more repetition in your schedule than you realize because I felt the same way. I was always someone who was like, I don't, I don't like to rigidly plan. I don't like to be on a schedule. I actually found that upon operating this way that I find that I'm much more, I'm much happier and, uh, stress-free by operating under uh, some form of scheduling, um, even if there is some, you know, looseness available within it. And I'll talk about that in a second here. But I do think that 
you probably if, if you're feeling that way upon listening to this, you probably have more repetition than you realize, or at least room to create repetition in a way that feels good to you and that, you know, fits with your personality and your, you know, your workflow habits and the way that you like to work. Related to that, I think something that's really important to consider when building out time blocks and setting up your schedule is allow time for context switch. It's really easy to be like, okay, I'm going to just fill up my day and it's going to be back to back things. Nothing will bring you closer to burnout than not having time to, you know, allowing some buffer time for switching around. You know, for example, like setting yourself up. This is this is a clear example of where it happens to me. If I've got back to back to back meetings with no breaks and then I have to switch into some kind of work, the ability to shift gears that quickly is really challenging. And anybody who tells you otherwise is lying to you, absolutely lying. <laughs> um, so I think building in that kind of time is a wise thing to do, uh, especially as you're getting started. Or if you found that like, man, I'm just not conforming to what I wanted to here. Like I built this out and it's not working for me. You just might not have allowed enough flexibility for yourself within it. So I think that that's really, really important to consider. And one other siren that might be going off in your head as you're hearing this, as creatives, we think a lot of times, I can't fit my creativity into you know, a rigid schedule. I can't just turn on songwriting at 4 p.m. and do it for eight hours. And you know what? I hear you. So everything that Ed and I just said, even if you excluded your creative work, your songwriting or your production, even if you excluded that from from what we were talking about, you would still be more productive than you have been. So give yourself that freedom. If this sounds like, you know, oh, that's a bad idea because I'm a creative and it doesn't fit into, you know, the creative vibe that I've kind of nurtured for years and years and years of being a musician uh, to fit my, you know, to try and shoehorn my creativity into a schedule. Great. Don't exclude that part until you get into the flow of doing it with other things. And then you might find eventually that maybe some pieces of your creativity fit into a flow. I personally have found that like production, like producing out tracks that can fit into a schedule just fine for me. So yeah, I think that's something that's important to consider and uh, hopefully smash that objection into the ground a little bit. Dude. Yeah. that That's a really good point because like the schedule that I was just running through for myself, that took like, two, three months for me to really understand where I could and couldn't do things. And I do leave time between like, this ends at 11, this starts at 1130. So those are two really good clarifications. Um, and regarding the creativity thing, like my creativity block of my time window is typically in the morning. And it's not like I have some hard goal for myself in that aspect. It's very flexible where I'm like, I got nine to 11 open to just play the guitar and feel and see what feels right. And so you got to define that for yourself, but you don't have to go into it and be like, I am creative now and I must come out with three songs. For me, it's just like, man, just hang around. And you know, if you come up something great, if you don't great, and then uh, do it again at night and see how it goes. And that's kind of how the writing is. So I think those are two really, really good points. So I think we have one final thing for you all and I'll let Jack jump into it regarding copywriting. This is the last little tip. We could probably do a whole episode on on AI and tools that are coming out. Maybe we'll slate that for the future for you guys since AI is all the rage right now. But I don't want to get too in the weeds with that kind of stuff just yet. But two tools that I would recommend diving into specifically around content creation and copy would be Jasper AI, which is a copywriting tool and chat GPT. Those two things can work hand in hand together, or you can get a feel for what you like about both of them when it comes to helping you write copy or come up with templates for your copy that you might dig. It can be especially useful for batching copy around content, specifically the Canva batch method that I had mentioned earlier in the episode, you can actually ask either of those tools in the chat mode to spit out a table, a table format, which then you could copy and paste right into Canva and use that batch creation tool to come up with some pretty cool stuff, something to mess with for sure. But I think both of those tools are really powerful. Personally, I think uh, Jasper is a 
a superb tool for getting the feel and the sound and the vibe of strong marketing copy ahead of ChatGPT. I think ChatGPT, at least in my experiences with it, has re required more refining uh, when it comes to writing solid marketing copy. So something to consider. You might play with ChatGPT and get some starting points and then take it over to Jasper and kind of refine it from there or refine it on your own. But both of those tools are definitely handy to give you kind of a kickstart when it comes to writing copy. Again, it's not going to do all the work for you, um, but it is a helpful tool. We use it here at the agency. Um, oftentimes, uh, you know, I think I mentioned back in uh, December when we were doing kind of our year-end wrap-up and our predictions for the new year that these AI tools were going to become more and more used. And at the time we didn't, you know, we were just kind of in play mode. Well, a lot of time in my week is spent, you know, working through prompts in these tools and using them to build out better and better copy or refining what I've started with or an idea that I've started with and giving me something to jump off with. So I definitely would recommend them for a productivity tool. They can be helpful as kind of getting you past that initial block if you've got one. So can't recommend it enough. As I mentioned before, if you're afraid of them, just go play with them. Now is a good time to just get our hands dirty with these types of tools. And I know you and I have been doing that for quite a while now. Yeah, absolutely. But it's the same thing. Like I had no reference point for when I started using these things. I just was like, what happens if I do this? What happens if I do that? And just gave myself time to explore. And so I think ultimately that's how you get comfortable with it. And that's how you make the most out of it. It is incredibly helpful once you get the hang of it to expedite the copywriting process. Like some of you can even select like the tone and stuff like that, or, you know, the the wit that they're using. And it's a tool that I don't think enough people are using yet outside of just making some funny memes, but something that probably is really, really helpful for you all, especially it helps you understand your brand. That's the other thing I've learned about this AI stuff is if I go in and I say, oh, I have an idea for this, like you said, you'll go in with a catchphrase or uh, idea for a copy. You go in with it and then they spin on other things and all of a sudden you have five new ideas. And that helps fuel my creativity of like, oh, what if a song was about this? Or what if a video played off of this idea? And so just like you said, be comfortable, go in there, explore it. But it's it's a great thing for productivity. And just the final note I wanted to make around this idea of how to 10x your productivity in general is that this isn't an overnight process, right? This is like something that is going to be trial and error. And we're sitting here today talking to you about like, here's the things we use and the things we do. I'm sure there's dozens of apps that we have tried before this that didn't work for us. And we're great apps, but just they weren't right for us. And the time blocking schedule, I've had to play around with that myself and figure out how to use it without overwhelming. And so the best thing you can do across the board with this is start to explore and put into place what works for you. And the last note is just keep an eye out for repetitive things in your schedule. That's That's where you can really begin to increase your productivity, whether it's phone calls, whether it's writing music, whether, you know, producing music, uh, brainstorming video ideas, like whatever it is, if you get in the habit of, of recognizing these patterns, that's where you can start to understand where you can increase your time and your productivity. That's the gold, dude. That's the gold. I love that. If, if you start anywhere and any of this is overwhelming, just look at your schedule for a couple of repetitive things and start to slate them onto your calendars. You can kind of build your stack around that. Get started slowly. If you've got a team, get yourself out of email inbox hell. Get yourself into Slack. I promise it will make your life better. Start batching your content. If that's one thing that you can do that gets you actually making content, I dare you, I challenge you, I implore you to go make one day out of your month a content day and it'll probably multiply what you do by 10. I hope you guys take these tips and some of these tools and go use them in ways that make the most sense for you. I hope you guys dug this episode. This was too much fun. We'll catch you guys next time on Creative Juice. Peace out, Indies!